Do you read Stephen King? Good news, there's a club for you. The Losers Club. Every Friday, us losers journey through the never-ending wastelands of King's Dominion. We sink our teeth into each of King's novels, dive deep into the lore, and review every adaptation. Even better, we're always having guests over. Thomas Jane, Will Wheaton, Mary Lambert, Mick Garris, the list goes on. So what are you waiting for? Join us as we read on through long days and pleasant nights. Consequence Podcast Network. Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks so much for checking out this series, listening to this episode here. If uh, this is something that you're into, you know, checking out what your uh, favorite artists are up to, do hope you hit that subscribe button, at least before you get out of here. Uh, we'll send you brand new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday so you can keep up with all of your favorite artists and discover some new ones, know what's happening in the music world. Of course, you can find us at all the major podcast hotspots like iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you like to get yours, wherever you're listening from right now. I'm Kyle Meredith, and today I'm once again going to be talking with Chrissy Hind of The Pretenders. They released a brand new record this year called Hate for Sale, one of my favorite Pretenders records Absolutely. Uh, It could have been a double album. That's what Chrissy tells us. And we'll talk about her writing with her guitarist, James Walburn, and uh, the difference uh, maybe in working with someone like uh, Dan Auerbach that she did on the Alone record, on the last Pretenders record. How this, uh, plenty of points on this record, kind of musically look back to the 50s and 60s uh, and the early days of the Pretenders. In fact... Founding drummer Martin Chambers is uh, is back on the seat for the first time in a little bit, so of course that gives them uh, not only history, but that early pretender sound I was just talking about. We'll also get into that title, Hate for Sale. Chrissy will be quick to tell you that it's not about what you think it is. This, this is not some kind of reflection on 2020 politics, but more so speaking to people making bad decisions, uh, being selfish. She says it's also something she's just having a little fun with with that title. But we will discuss uh, the actual word hate as a very strong word and the opposite, love, as a drug addiction. Now, through quarantine, Chrissy's been doing some Bob Dylan covers online, uh, along with James Walburn helping her out here. So we're going to talk about that Bob Dylan covers series and her appreciation for Mr. Dylan's brand new album as well. So let's get into it, discussing the record Hate for Sale. It's Kyle Meredith with Chrissy Hine of The Pretenders. Hi. Congratulations on uh, Hate for Sale. This is as good as a record as I would hope it'd be. In fact, I want to say it's one of the best uh, records I think that you've done for your career so far. Oh, great. Well, that's good news. <laughs> I have a feeling a lot of people are saying that, too. I mean, um, you, you and I got to talk about this record a couple years ago, obviously before it was officially uh, announced. And even back then, I think that you were feeling positive about it because you had said it potentially could have been a, a double record. I'm guessing it was just timing that kind of made that not work out was that the case yeah actually i forgot about that that's um glad you brought that up you know we have uh, songs that we just didn't get around to and we wanted to get cracking and get it out and um keep it short and sweet so yeah but there's a uh, yeah there are some songs we we didn't finish and we'll have to get onto that thanks for reminding me yeah well no problem uh, especially if it means that really that they can come out because i'm always up for uh for more music from you uh, have you ever done a double album? I'm trying to think if that's even ever happened. No, I don't think so. No, no, I haven't. They've it's... all been pretty much, I suppose, 11 tracks. I think this one's 10. Well, it's a, it's it's perfect in the sense. I know one of the uh, the the hooks of the I guess the press hooks of this record is is you finally finding time, as you put it, to to write with uh, James Walburn, who's been in your band for quite some time. Is there any reason why you've kept separation between who you write with and and versus? you know, who you're playing with on the road? No, not at all. We always thought we'd get together. And we it's just never, you know, you're on the road and you think it's, uh, oh, yeah, we'll get a room at the back of the bus and a couple of guitars. And it just, you just don't. Uh, some people might. I find when I'm on the road, I'm not, my head isn't right for it. And then we'd come off the road and take some time off. And James would get stuck into other projects. And then I'd end up going off somewhere. I don't have a studio, so I'd meet a producer I wanted to work with and go to on a Stockholm, Nashville, and it, that's just the way it worked out. 
yeah, but we really were missing that. And we said, well, we're really going to sit down and do it this time. Yeah, I, I had wondered if that, you know, is the cause for, again, I, I've loved every record that you've put out, especially over the past 20 years, uh, you know, with a large part of that him being in the band. But I wonder if this record sounds the way it does because there is that extra comfort factor, you know, as opposed to like Dan Auerbach last time who, you know, you hadn't spent as much time with, I guess. I'm not sure that you need to spend time with someone. If, if it's right and you go in, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I could have done this with James a long time ago. I mean, with Dan, he's very immediate. I, it's not really a com- you know, it's not really a comfort thing. If anything, it's the opposite. You know, you can get too comfortable. And that's what you don't want. You want to keep it edgy. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know why we didn't do it earlier. But we certainly had ideas. We just haven't got around to it. Did you all talk about, you know, how it was going to sound going into it? I mean, you've mentioned before, you know, really loving R&B. And I can hear, uh, you know, especially like in Fool and and didn't want to be this lonely. I mean, that's not exactly a Bo Diddley beat. That's one of those almost versions there. But it seems like a lot of the style of music does kind of point to an era. Well, you know, even though James is uh, younger, I mean, he's just turned 40. Um, he's his favorite artist is Elvis Presley, and he grew up. He's one of those guys whose dad took him to see him and his brother just to see every band. It wouldn't matter who it was, Liza Minnelli, whatever it was, they went and saw it. And uh, he's a real music person. He's played with Jerry Lee Lewis. He's very old school in his approach. Um, uh, he's a multi instrumentalist. Um, he just loves playing instruments, and, and he's amazing. And that's we we really did make an, uh, a very clear plan. It's not much of a plan. It was just to return to basics. Two guitars, bass, drums, a smattering of keyboards, which he plays. And uh, just to keep it, you know, the songs. I personally like songs you can dance to. And then just keep them with melody, choruses, you know, just very trad rock. There's a lot of dancing. Although I bring up, uh, you know, I would mentioned uh, Fool on there too. And it's maybe more in that, uh, you know, I'll stand by you vein, the, the, the balladry. To me, that might be one of the most cl- immediate classic sounding songs that, that I feel like I've heard from you. Um, at least, you know, it, I, I guess what I'm saying is it, it hit me, I guess, at the right moment at the right time. But it's such a powerful song. With James and I actually on that song in particular, he had that title. I think he read it in the, he was reading the book and he said, listen to this. You can't hurt a fool. And I said, oh, got to write a song called that and we really tried to craft that song in a very you know a very old school uh we really knew what we were going for but i mean you you know you you can't buy it in the shops you do have to sit down and figure it out it's always something to try to like sneak in a key change that's not obvious or that you don't really notice so it just lifts it you know we really paid attention to that one in particular also having martin back in the band back on the on the studio albums does having a link you know back to the beginning having so much shared history does that put it also in, in any kind of state of mind you know in, the, in that early sounding kind of way it certainly puts it in a in a state of sound because martin has a very unique distinctive sound and then he's a riot to watch live he's fantastic to play with because he's just the you know one of the great entertaining showboaters um i think he's a real drummer's drummer you know he's fun that's what's great about him um and again i have made many albums without him not many i haven't made that many albums but uh and that was it's just the way it, it pans out sometimes you know again logistics people are doing other things and it's been a long time so certainly having him on this album was um it really sounds like the pretenders because you know he is very instrumental to the sound there's a there's a huge immediacy to a lot of these songs that i know that uh he has a large part in just being you know the rhythm behind it um really pushes it along i love it last time we spoke too, you know you, you'd already kind of said that you had the title in mind with hate for sale and and were quick to correct me when i assumed it had anything to do with you know what was happening in the world the administration and everything like that uh, and you've talked about it that a bit more in the most recent interviews you know speaking towards i think you said mean-spirited commercialism has that idea of hate for sale changed for you over these past two years as as the world has continued in the direction it's going no, because the world's been going in this direction for 2,000 years. I mean, it's not, it's nothing new. It certainly is escalating, and things are getting pretty crazy. Um, and a lot of things, there's curveballs right, left, and center that no one saw coming. But just uh, the, the whole idea of um, 
people making bad decisions and being selfish and doing the wrong thing. Uh, I'd like to say that's a new thing, but in my experience, it's a very old thing. So it's anything, I mean, hate because that was supposed to be a bit of fun, uh, but people seem to think I'm, and also I don't, tr I try not to get too much into current uh, affairs because I like the music to have a more timeless feel to it. I mean, it's not a calculated thing. We've been doing, James and I have been doing some Bob Dylan songs over the phone during the lockdown. And, you know, some of the songs we're doing are, you know, 40, 50 years old, and they sound so relevant to everything that's going on in the world today. But then they don't call him Bob Dylan for nothing. That's true. You've actually, you sussed out a few songs that I, I wouldn't have imagined people really, like, like, don't fall apart on me tonight. I feel like you heard something that most didn't. It, it, you know, that's, that's a really looked over era for Bob right there. What, what made you tackle that one? What brought that one on? I was looking for some of his songs that, again, have choruses that we can interpret because, you know, it'd be very easy to copy Bob's style. You know, everyone can do it. Um, he's got such a distinctive uh, style. So you have to really meditate on the songs and try to deliver them in a, in a way that, um, you know, find your own voice on them, especially when you've heard them a lot. That one wasn't one of his greatest hits, I guess. So it seemed more open to interpretation, I suppose. And it had a chorus, which he didn't make much of in his version. So, you know, I tried to find things where I'm not saying we, uh, we are doing them better than Bob did. But, you know, it's nice to be able to interpret it in a way. I, you don't have to say that. I, I'm going to say you did that one better than Bob did. And I, I'm a fan of that song. I'm a fan of that era, too. But, uh, you know, complete props because I know that's not a given. That's not easy when you've got such a classic songwriter. H have you spent much time with the new album? Have I spent much time with the new album? Yeah, Bob's new album. I'm sorry. Mean? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have. Uh, I haven't listened to it. I, I'll sit down and listen to the whole thing in a go. I have spent uh, some very important time uh, with part of it. In fact, when Murder Most All came out, it really lifted me out of a, a malaise. You know, I was in kind of a weird state of mind when all this came down a few months ago. And then all of a sudden, uh, someone sent me that song and um, it just seemed, everything seemed to change from that moment uh, for some reason, just because, uh, you know, it was a feeling of, um, I lifted me out of that feeling of being locked down. It was very freeing to hear that. He's good at that. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll bring it back to your record, um, obviously, with, with Hate for a Sale. Uh, and I want to hit back, so I want to play the other side of the coin on that. You know, as we talked about the title and the title track not, you know, reflecting what is happening currently. It, and I'm apologies if I'm reaching here, but I was thinking back to the previous record on Alone, and you had the song I Hate Myself. And I was wondering if there's sort of any kind of thread that bridges, you know, how your I don't know, using that word? Because, I mean, obviously, hate is such a strong word, even when you're trying to have a little bit of fun with it. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think probably we overuse the word hate and we overfeel the emotion hate. There's no doubt about that, too. Uh, you know, throughout the day, you'll say, oh, I hate that, or oh, I hate it when people say that, or oh, I hate it, or oh, uh, you know, it's kind of a very common ongoing theme. I'm not sure that I, we use the word lightly, very flippantly. Um, I hate myself on the last album was again. I, I that was uh, that, you know to me they're rock songs so they have to be fun. I think that's just my take on it. You know, I mean we we all have albums we love to listen to when we're down, but I don't think anyone puts on an album to get even more depressed. You know, <laughs> you usually want something to pull you up. But no, is hate a thing? <laughs> uh, not. Uh, maybe it is. Maybe you're telling me something a bit like that. No, I've never been in therapy, but maybe I am now. <laughs> yeah, I'm finding out something I didn't know. <laughs> The, the opposite, of course, you know, being love shows up uh, in various ways on the buzz in this really unique you know, concept that you've put out there with, uh, you know, love as a comparison to drug addiction. If I got that right, do you find it a challenge to approach a subject with a new angle, um, especially something that's been written about as love has, relationships have, you know, and, and for as long as you've been a songwriter, is it a challenge to find a unique new angle like that? Well, I don't think it is a unique angle. I think that's a, a pretty old, uh, that's another stock go-to, I think, when Billie Holiday sang, um, in fact, I sang it myself on the Val Bone Woe album, uh, uh, what was the song, I'm a Fool to Love You, um, I'm a Fool to Hold You, uh, you know, that also sounded like drug addiction. I'm a fool to need you. Uh, Otis Redding singing, I've been loving you too long. Your love's become a habit to me. I can't stop. It sounds to me like a very, in fact, that's the beauty for me of songs is you don't necessarily know 
what it's about, but you uh, you sort of adapt the song to your own needs, your own emotional needs. So if you're having addiction problems, all those things can apply. Or if you're obsessively, you know, in some crazy relationship that, uh, you know, or most relationships, I suppose, you know, one bad text that day and your day's ruined. Um, that's like not getting a fix, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, you made it sound fresh, uh, you know, the compliments on that. And, and, and you know, and at the expense of over complimenting you, I will keep doing that anyway, because uh, I'm such a fan of what you do. I love this new record. It's one of my favorite releases. It's came out this year. I so oh, appreciate, thanks. you know, yes, you continuing to do what you do and Chrissy, and it's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you very much. I, that, that's what I was trying to say about Bob. When I heard that, I thought, thank you, man, for just, just you're, you've been with us all this time and you're still doing it. And you know, it means a lot. So it means a lot that you say that to me. Absolutely. It was great talking to you. Take care out there. I hope we'll see you around at some point soon. Yeah, I hope so, too. All right. Bye. Cheers. Bye. My thanks, Chrissy Hine. The brand new Pretenders record is called Hate for Sale. Now, it was just 2018, a couple years ago, the uh, the first time Chrissy and I spoke. And at this point, we were going to be talking about her forthcoming book of original artwork called Adding the Blue, uh, as well as The Environment and the 10th anniversary of the Pretenders record Break Up the Concrete, which is another favorite of mine. And this was the moment where uh, Chrissy was telling us about the details on two new records she had in the works, uh, Hate for Sale and, uh, and, and a Standards record that uh, just came out last year as well. So part two of Kyle Meredith with Pretenders. Hello. We are so excited to have the Pretenders uh, back in Louisville, the Louisville Palace. That's just next week on July 3rd. It's a homecoming for me because I lived in Louisville when I was a baby. I had no clue about that. How have yeah, I never no, heard I about that? No, I forgot myself because I was a baby. <laughs> but um, I always, my parents always refer to it. My dad was in the Marines. Well, um, I know there's some music stuff to talk about, but I feel like this year is also busy for you in the non-music world. I wanted to ask some questions about um, some of the other stuff you have going on. First off, the uh, the book of art you have coming out in September called Adding the Blue. 200 original works. This is a really cool story because... It, it, these are. This is sort of a recent thing for you, right? Yeah, well, it is and it isn't. I, I thought that would be what I'd be into since I was a kid because that's the one thing I could do naturally. I wasn't good at school. And then, of course, I grew up in the 60s, so I got totally waylaid by rock and roll. You know, once I started listening to the radio, that was game over for the painting. <laughs> and then I went to Kent State University, but I was a dropout. I didn't really go to classes. I didn't um, study anything except pot and music. And then I left the States and I got into music and completely forgot about it. So just a few years ago, I, I thought, why am I still thinking about painting? I don't even know if I can paint. I've never done it. And I started. And once I started, I couldn't stop. Wow. Like naturally coming back to you in a way. Oh, uh, well, it's just what I, yeah, it's like what I liked when I was a kid. So, I mean, I had to figure it out. I didn't even know how to clean my brushes. So I wrecked a few brushes along the way. And I didn't intend to put them in a book. It's this, there's this brother and sister, uh, Catherine and Nick Roylance, and their dad had started, he was a 60s guy in London, and he had this thing called Genesis Books, and I, I guess he did features on the rock stars of the day and stuff. Anyway, they approached me, and I gave them a few snapshots of a few of the paintings. I, to be honest, I wasn't really that interested in a book or anything. I was going off on tour. But when I got back, they presented me with this mock-up of the book, and it was so well thought out. And I said, well, you just do whatever you want. And that's what they've done now, and that's going to come out in the form of this book. Yeah. Now, is it? Uh, it, it are we just looking at your paintings in this book, or is there any narrative that goes along with it? it there's a bit of, you know, yeah, a little bit of narrative where they just, you know, kind of talk you through a few of the so yeah a little bit yeah yeah and and, and those two examples out there for us to look at and and they're really good i mean they're really cool you know i i don't have the proper lexicon i think to talk art completely but neither do i man i don't know anything about the art world i'm not particularly interested in it i mean i love paintings like everyone else i i'm in philadelphia i might go to the go to a museum today but i forget to go to museums or galleries it's not really my my scene, you know, but um, sometimes I enjoy it. I, to be perfectly honest, I look at a lot of this stuff and I just think you're just a phony. You know, I don't get a lot of these installations and things. I think, well, sorry, but that's me. I'm a, you know, I'm in a rock band. So part of my job is to be real cynical about everything. But um, I, for me, any any form of art, whether it's music or art, it, 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 the purpose of it is to lift me, not to disturb me. I feel I'm already disturbed. So, uh <laughs> 
but yeah, it's, it doesn't even need to be thought provoking. It's supposed to just light the room up a little bit. But that's just my opinion. What, what I'll notice, though, you know, the one thing that is sort of obvious on it, 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 just judging by those two that's out there, is they're sort of completely different in style. And I guess that's what I was impressed by. Like, are you drawn to painting in one sort of way, or is it just, you know, I don't know where, where the brush takes you? Yeah, I just get a blank canvas and start stabbing away at it. I don't have any preconceived. I mean, I started painting. It sounds very elementary, and it is. I started painting flowers because they're beautiful, and it gave me something to focus on. And I tried not to do too many portraits because that's kind of my natural propensity is to do that. And I thought, well, that's going to be too easy. And uh, and also with photography, we don't need po- portraits. Uh, but I kept doing those because they're like a natural thing, and I find it uh, it's kind of a meditation for me. I just get into it, do it for four hours, and then leave the house and go have a sandwich or something. But, yeah, it's just a hobby. Well, I think there's something else, and I'll jump to the next subject here that, that's not a hobby, uh, something you've been very proud to talk about throughout your career, and that's animal rights. Uh, I was reading through your, I think it was Facebook or something the other day, and you were talking about a project that had to do with cows. Yeah, it's my cow protection thing. This is kind of what it's all leading up to and what I've been into for the last 40 years, really. And it's about, well, what it's about, it's it's, it's an it's ancient uh, Vedic culture, which is where yoga, all these good practices that were, are pretty commonplace these days, vegetarianism, this, you know, where the cow is considered holy. It's definitely been lost in our current culture, but I think we can bring it back. It's about small farming, uh, and the four principles of cow protection is, number one, you never kill a cow. Number two, calves must suckle from their mothers as long as they need to, six months or whatever. That's not how it works on an industrial farm, and that's what the vegans have a problem with. But I'm not talking about industrial farming. I'm talking about small farms. Number three, uh, the cows should be milked by hand. And number four is that the uh, oxen have to be given meaningful work, i.e. plowing the fields. Now, the first benefit of this very small farming uh, where nothing gets hurt and the cows are retired back into the herd and uh, they don't have to be preg- impregnated every year. They, they, it's, it's a very natural, there's no artificial insemination. It's self-sustaining. There's, it's not a profit-making thing, so you'll never find any industry jumping onto it like they have with the vegan thing because they can't produce it cheaply. This is a self-sustaining just for the family that has the cows in the local community. But the, the thing that's really important about it right now is that on globally we're losing all our topsoil and any environmentalist knows about this anyone knows about it because everyone goes on the internet but the topsoil is what we need to plant crops and if we don't have any we're all going to starve so the great thing about this uh, small farming situation with cows is that unlike when you put 10,000 in a warehouse and they create methane gas which is what everyone's talking about if you have just uh, I don't know, 12 ca- cows eating grass that we can't eat. They produce cow manure or dung, and that is what restores the topsoil. So if we start getting these small farms, we can correct the problem of the topsoil, and that's really what it's all about. Uh, that's that's what caught my uh, my eye uh, in here when the conversation started was the environmental impact of, you know, just eating meat at all, you know, beyond even you know, what you're getting at with here. It's just the environmental impact, I think, was it blew my mind. Well, I mean, meat eating is so far behind me now. That's been over 40 years, or that's way in my past. Right. I mean, we're so far ahead of that now. That's like a, that's like smoking. You know, who right. does it now? Right. You know, it's 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 you know, I mean, and that, again, number one principle of cop protection is you never kill them. Uh-huh. So um, that's just not doesn't feature into anything really, in an intelligent uh, argument of anything. So it, it's certainly f- not environmentally. It's the number one enemy on this planet at the moment of what's how we've devastated this you know everything the topsoil the rainforest it's all been chopped down for meat eaters so stop it i mean it's got to feel like such an uphill battle to get this conversation out there it's not only is it uphill but i'm, I'm bored stupid of this subject because i've been going on about it for 40 years but you know then also it's my subject and it's you know if you had one of those game shows where you have a panel you know what's your subject that would be my subject That's so it. you know i keep getting drawn into it well i I appreciate you enlightening me a little bit more. I do apologize then for, uh, you know, going over well-tread ground there. So No problem. I mean, you know, I'm writing a book on it. or I'm getting someone to help me to get some of the research on the history of cows throughout human history. 
And, uh, you know, I've actually been dropped by one of the animal rights groups that I was a patron of for 25, 30 years because they're all anti-milk now. But I would like to qualify that by saying they're anti-milk because of industrial farming. And the, when you buy commercial milk, you are buying it from the meat industry. But what I'm talking about is the opposite of that. This might play uh, a little bit into, uh, I've heard you talking about new music a little bit as well. Um, and, and the record you're working on, the title's called Hate for Sale? Oh, no. Well, that's not going to happen yet. That's going to be next year. That's just the stuff that I'm writing with James Wolver, my guitar player. Yes, that, that is a, the title. But the next album I have coming out is called Valve Bone Woe, and that's a sort of jazz dub thing. That'll be out in the beginning of next year. Oh, cool. What's the, are you working on someone with that one? Is, yeah, that, that's that's a, finished. That's that I've been working on that for years because the guy I'm working with, Marius DeFries, lives in L.A. He's English, but he lives over there. So we just haven't, you know, I've done two albums and written a book in the amount of time that, since we started that. But it's finally getting, fi- well, finished. So that should be out at the end of, uh, beginning of next year. I'm really interested to hear that. I mean, the way you describe that with the genres there, that seems like a, I know you're always, you know, striving to, to try out new sounds. Well, you know, actually I'm not. I'm pretty lazy and I just keep <laughs> doing the same thing. You know, I think I'm on the spectrum, you know, dunk, 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 dunk. I just do the same thing over and over, but... Um, you know, a new song always has, it's, you know, like the next day in your life, you know, you're still alive. So keep expressing it. But, uh, this thing was started as a, I did a song in a film called the eye of the beholder, which had Ashley Judd and, uh, Ewan McGregor in it. And this is about 15 years ago. And, um, it was a, a version of a song called, I wish you love. It's a French writer called Charles Fanet in English. <clears throat> I mean, actually I'm doing it in French for this album, but, um, that took me 30 years to learn how to do. But uh, they, it's a, with a big orchestra and it's kind of electronic. If you you could find that song, I Wish You Love, from the Eye of the Beholder. And that's, I think it was on a Pretenders album too. But uh, so it's more of that, you know, it's kind of trippy jazz, but um, with uh, this kind of, I don't know, psychedelic trance music arrangements and a big orchestra. It's, it's, it's pretty far out. No, if you don't mind, I'd still like to ask a little bit about the the, the one that comes after that. Then, but just, and I'm it's it's sort of enticing that title, "Hate for Sale." Maybe it's low hanging fruit for our times right now. Uh, well, I don't know why everyone's saying that we're living through dark times because, you know, I'm I've just got from San Francisco. I'm in Philadelphia. I've had a great experience here. I think we're in much better shape than we've been in for years. I'm not talking about any administrations. I'm talking about where we are. You know, just socially. Gays can get married. I mean, it's it's no longer, you know, if I had been, if I was gay, when I, you would only associate me with being a gay singer, a lesbian singer over the last 30 years. But in the last three years, if someone is uh, gay, no one even mentions it anymore. You know, it's a huge, huge stride forward for the whole gay community. Like everyone can relax now because really it's not an issue anymore. It's, it's, it's accepted. It's normal. And everyone's cool with it. And nobody's labeled by it anymore. I mean, I know this is early days for that, but that's what I've seen. You know, you can open a fashion magazine and see girls sitting holding hands in the front row and no one says lesbian couple. They just say, oh, you know, they're going out with each other. We've had a black president. I mean, huge stride forward. In California, pot's legal. You know, I knew guys that went down for, you know, dealing pot and had being arrested for pot. We all did. I yeah. mean, we weren't all arrested for it, but we all smoked it. and It was always illegal. So, I mean, there's been really significant positive. I mean, I walked around Philadelphia yesterday, and there was a lot of great little, little organic cafes and things. I went, I was in an airport two days ago, and I could get something to eat. I haven't been able to get anything to eat in an airport for 30 years. So I think we're in really good shape. I don't know why everyone says it's dark. It's not dark, it's light. Well, I, I know it's for me, it's easy to get caught up in the sensationalistic headlines that, that get out there. Although I appreciate this because, you know, I mean, David Byrne has been talking about something similar. He, he does his weekly reason to be optimistic or, or whatever he calls it. Um, but, you know, it, it would beg to, to question then, what, does that title come from anywhere else specifically then? Oh, it, the Hate for Sales it sounds kind of like a damned song. It's, a, you know, a rocker. And uh, what is it? Hate for Sale. He's got a curly tongue and a curly tail. You know, it's just it's a it's just talking about in general this kind of mean spirited commercialism, I suppose. Well, and the fact that you know it's potentially a double album, uh, 
That's, I mean, for fans, that's that's seriously exciting. Yeah, well, that depends if we get enough time to. I mean, James and I started demos, but we when we're offered tours, we always down tools and want to go on tour because we love going on tour. So, but uh, well, once we get that together, I want to record it. I and mean, we only need a couple of weeks to record something, and we will record it with this band, which I haven't done in the last two albums because people have been busy doing other things. But this is. If I can nail them down for two weeks, we can record it with the band you're going to see. And now, do you know? Uh, it, uh, you know, there, there was one record now that was just under your your, your own name with Chrissy Hine. Uh, do you think that this is a Pretenders record or a solo record? Have you thought that far ahead? Uh, the Chrissy Hine thing was just uh, you know I was so tired of explaining that I work with the band and everyone said yeah, but it's just you and I was like well no it's not and then I thought okay call it what you want but it's always I always work with the band now I'm having to explain it the other way around. <laughs> Um, certainly the Valve Bone Woe album, which is coming out, the Jazz Dub album, that's not a pretenders thing. Although James Walburn does play on it, my guitar player. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nobody in any band has ever stayed together for 40 years. They fall out with each other in a way because my original band, two members died after we made our second album. I've kind of kept the music alive in the spirit of the band and kept the sound. But, you know, it doesn't happen to everyone, thankfully. But most bands do split. They just go off and do other things. And, you know, I'm no different. But I only work in the context of a band. Well, I was looking, listening back to one of those recent records, uh, Break Up the Concrete, because it is the 10th anniversary year. Uh, look at that. And and uh, and I saw you mentioned that you might be doing a re-release. I didn't know if that was just because it was out of issue or you were thinking about expanding it or, or what. But it's a good I record. I just never saw it for a while. I, don't, I think maybe it was out of. I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I think. Is it out of? Oh, I, I think it's still available. Or something or whatever they call it that yeah. they deleted it. I don't know. Um, but that no, I love that album because that was recorded uh, with James Wilborn and um, Nick uh, Wilkinson. Martin Chambers wasn't on that just because we uh, did it in eleven days and we pulled it together very quickly. And Jim Keltner, who's you know as everyone knows, is a you know one of the great guitar, uh, great drummers of all time. He played on it, and that allowed us to do it very quickly because he's a genius. And that's the way we'll record this next album with the band in the studio. It's what we call live recording. I mean, it's not live like a live gig, but you know you do three takes of the song, take the best one, and then there you go on to yeah. the next one. Well, I can give you the compliments on that record too. I mean, especially that one-two punch right at the beginning of uh, Boots of Chinese Plastic and the Nothing Maker. Two of the strongest songs, you know, to kick off a record. Uh, I, I do love those. So, uh, oh, we'll bring them back. We'll bring them back for next year. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That really would. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we also have a, a mutual um, a friend. Uh, you more so for you, uh, more of a, an acquaintance for me and Richard Swift. And uh, I was uh, really happy to see you out there, kind of pushing to to help him out too. So, yeah, I. Oh, do you know Richard? I've met him. We have a lot of mutual friends, and I've been such an admirer of his. So, like, I'm I'm the one that anytime I have been around him, saying like, "Hey, where's that solo record? Where's that next solo record?" Because I love his music so much. Yeah, Swift was working on a solo record, and he sent me some tracks, and they're just fantastic. One of the most talented uh, and loveliest guys I've ever met, and a real right hand man to Dan Arbuck, who was his best friend. And, uh, in fact, when we were in the studio doing the Alone album, Richard took a couple of, well, I come, we call him Swift, took a couple of pictures on his phone, and I said, you're going to do all the photography for this. And then I saw him doing some drawings. I said, and you're doing all the artwork. So all of our images just all around super talented and he's not very well and I'm not really sure that he's uh, he's going to get through this so I would love to think that everyone could at least put in a nice thought for Richard and wish him well now that's uh, I, I really hope so too it's it's I didn't know the state of it um, it's really heartbreaking it really really is uh, such an uh, amazing well he's 41 years old and you know he's got three teenage daughters and they're all lovely you know he's a lovely guy I never saw him in any way as a negative or a dark person but he's you know a life of excess really caught up with him fast so let's all the best to swift and hope he gets through this yeah same here um i don't want to end it right there on that it, it kind of dark note anyway but you, yeah, you it's kind of a bummer yeah you brought up dan and that record too the alone record was so good i know he's working tons now in his studio do, do you foresee you getting doing anything down there on his side of things have you guys talked about that i would work with dan in a heartbeat at any time i just love him i i love him as a guy i love his musical sensibility he's a great guitar player uh, which is what attracted me to him in the first place of course and you know he's just fun he never gets rattled he's 
he's upset at the moment, obviously, because of our friend. But, I, you know, he's a very, I mean, I knew his parents from Akron, Ohio before. I, I left Akron before he was even born. But when I'm with Dan, I always feel like he's older than me. He's just, he's just got something that's very authoritative. And, uh, yeah, I'd do anything with Dan at any time. I heard his dad's actually got a record coming out. You mentioned his parents there. Chuck, uh, oh, really? Chuck Auerbach, yeah. His, uh, Dan's going to be releasing a, a Chuck record. So Amazing. Yeah. Well, Dan works with, uh, you know, he got Dwayne Eddy on my record. Oh, right, right, which is awesome, you know? It's just yeah, having that crew amazing. down there. Yeah. Although I would warn anyone that listens to the, the Alone album, although it's great and Swift is all over it and Dan's playing guitar on it, it's, 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 it's a blast. But um, my voice isn't very good, just a warning. <laughs> because I had bronchitis, I could hardly talk. And I said to, to Danny when I got in, I said, I, I, how am I going to sing? I can't even talk. And he goes, ah, don't worry about it. We'll do it in the last three days. It'll make it sound cohesive. Uh, so, you know, if you hear me choking on some of those songs, you'll know why. You know, it never even occurred to me. I've heard that record dozens of times. It ne- I never once thought, oh, but her voice. You know, just didn't occur. Yeah, well, I wasn't a very good. I wasn't in fine voice. I'm hoping I'll be in a better voice when I get to Louisville. We're looking forward to it again uh, July 3rd at the Louisville Palace. We share a wall with it, so it's going to be an easy trek for me. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. This has really been an honor for me, and I cannot wait to catch the show. Nice. We can't wait ourselves, so thank you, and we look forward to it. All right. Take care, Chrissy. Cheers. All right, bye. bye. A 2018 interview there with uh, with Chrissy Hine. Again, the brand new Pretenders record is called A Hate for Sale. So thanks for Chrissy for the conversation today. Thanks to you for checking out this episode. Before you get out, I do hope you'll hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening from or in any of the major podcast hotspots like iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, even YouTube. You can subscribe over there as well. We'll bring you brand new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And after that, head over to WFPK.org where I do a show Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, and bonus interviews, 6 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Kyle Meredith on all three of those. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org from Louisville Public Media.